thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much to everyone in the audience for your attention. Um, a slight change to the program, I recently left Great Western Exotics. I was there now for, you tell us. I was there for four and a half years. I did an internship and a residency program in exotic animal medicine. Um, my mentor was, a, origi or originally anyway, was a chap called Neil Forbes, who many of you probably know in this room. Um, I now have moved back home to Cardiff. I'm sure you could all tell I was from Cardiff by my strong Welsh <laughs> accent um, to set up an exotic animal service there. And I'm going to deal with private sector exotics and Romain is going to go on to talk about zoos. So what are we talking about when we talk about exotics? And as an exotic vet, the majority of my cases probably are rabbits and guinea pigs and hamsters and gerbils and the sort of small furries, the more mammalian patients. Um, and we've agreed that we're going to put those kind of to one side for this discussion. So this is mostly going to be about our birds and our reptiles, to some extent our amphibians, um, and also the more exotic mammals, things like African pygmy hedgehogs, sugar gliders, which we're seeing more and more of. And I've put some statistics here. Nobody can really agree on the statistics, um, but these are some statistics from the Pet Food Manufacturers Association. So they reckon there's about half a million indoor birds and about 800,000 reptiles in the UK. But if you look at sales of live food and vivariums and various other things, that would tend to suggest that these figures are conservative. And I think before we consider whether we can meet their welfare needs and, if not, what we can do in terms of regulation <laughs> to improve things, it's worth sort of considering what legislation is in place already. And I'm sure lots or the vast majority of people will be familiar with these acts. But just very briefly, I think these are probably sort of the four most relevant acts. Um, Wildlife and Countryside Act, less so. There are some implications. There's a list of birds of prey that come under that, which are Schedule 4, and if you own one of those birds of prey, you have to, be, you have to register it, etc. cetera. Um, but slightly less relevant. And then we've got the Dangerous Wild Animals Act. So basically, there is a list of species which are perceived potentially to pose a risk to the public. And if you want to own one of those species, you have to be inspected by your local authority with a veterinary surgeon present. Um, mostly the inspection focuses on health and safety and whether there's a risk to the public, but it does also, or it should also, take into consideration animal welfare. And all of your common zoo animals are on there in terms of birds. Some, some ratites are on there, so cassowaries are on there, and they are quite dangerous. Um, venomous snakes, venomous lizards. Interestingly, the Komodo dragon is not on the list. And um, I think if you had a pet Komodo dragon and it escaped and it wandered down your local high street, there would be a bit of a health and safety issue there. Um, and then we've got the Animal Welfare Act, which of course underpins everything and, and means that we must provide the five welfare needs for any animals that we keep in captivity. And most recently, we've had the Animals Activities Licensing, which came out in England um, last autumn. And that affects anyone who uses or sells or makes perform animals on a commercial basis. So with that new act, there is a set of minimum standards for different exotic animals, so for birds and for reptiles and for small mammals, and that includes minimum enclosure sizes, temperatures, UV light, record keeping, etc. So that's come out very recently, and I think that's a really good act, and I think that's going to be very positive, actually, for exotic animal welfare. And when we're considering whether we can meet the needs of exotic animals, I think we can't tar them all with the same brush we've got to consider each species individually. So I've got two examples here. A wandering albatross, I would suggest, is very difficult to meet the welfare needs of in captivity. Um, it spends its years gliding through the skies over several thousand kilometers. It spends the first five or six years of its life without touching land. And I think for that to be able to fulfill its normal behavior patterns in captivity will be very difficult. On the other hand, an Argentine horned frog, also known as a Pac-Man frog, is a relatively sort of sedentary animal that lives in a patch of forest floor. Most of the time it's buried under some leaf litter and it sits and it waits for anything smaller than it to come past so that it can engulf it. And I think actually to recreate the natural habitat of this animal and fulfill its welfare needs is more realistic. 
So I'm going to give you a few examples now of <coughs> scenarios that I would commonly see in practice. So I've got here a jungle carpet python. This is owned by a reptile enthusiast. He's got hundreds of snakes. It's kept in a rack system, so it's kept in a plastic box in a sort of shelving unit. Um, it's a constant temperature, so the room is a constant temperature, and it's, it's within this species' preferred optimum temperature range, but there isn't really any change experienced by the animal. It's a very sort of fixed environment. It's got some kitchen roll, it's got a water bowl, and it's fed every Tuesday on a defrosted mouse. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't think that we are meeting the welfare needs of this animal. I think this animal has a very boring existence with no environmental enrichment. It's a semi-arboreal species. One of its normal behaviors is, the, is to be able to climb, which it can't do, um, to experience differences in humidity, to experience differences in temperature, to be able to hide in different places. So I think there is a welfare issue when we look at this scenario. On the other hand, this is a scrub python called Matilda. So this is a, a patient of mine. This is the client setup. This is a scrub python. I, I didn't have a, a, a jungle carpet python example, but this is a very closely related species. So this is kept in a large vivarium. Um, you can just about see the snake. It's over here somewhere. Um, but this is a large vivarium with a thermal gradient with a hot end where the snake can go and choose to bask and a cold end and temperatures in between. It's got the ability to climb. It's got the ability to fully immerse itself in water. It's got hiding places. It's fed on a variety of prey items, not always on the same day every week. And the decor in this setup is changed regularly. And this snake is registered with an exotic animal vet and gets excellent veterinary care if it needs it. And ladies and gentlemen, I think we are meeting this animal's welfare needs to a good enough standard personally. Although I think things can always be improved. So I've got another example here. This is Bobby, a four-year-old African gray parrot. He's hand-reared. He was, he was raised in an ice cream tub in a brooder by a human. He didn't see any other parrots as he was growing up. And he was bought from a pet shop by an owner who works nine to five, who keeps him in a typical parrot cage and feeds him this diet in the middle, um, which predominantly consists of sunflower seeds. And Neil Forbes, my mentor, always used to say, every sunflower seed to a parrot is the equivalent of eight Mars bars to us in fat. So this bird is eating a shocking diet. And this is not good welfare. Um, Bobby has an extensive vocabulary. The owner has no other birds. He comes out for an hour or two every evening. The reason he came to see me is because he started pulling out his feathers. I wonder why. On the other hand, this would be another example of s some patients of mine. Um, I've taken these images off the internet because I didn't have pictures, but I, I, see, I see the other end of the spectrum as well. So we've got some parrots here. These are social imprints. So they were raised with other parrots. They have the ability to fly. They have indoor and outdoor accommodation. They spend three or four hours a day foraging, which is what a parrot normally would do. And I think that these parrots have reasonably good welfare as well. Um, we have to consider the human benefits. We have to consider that pets and exotics included are good for our health. They lower our blood pressure. They're good for our economic situation. Animals in captivity don't suffer from the same competition from the same risks of predation, from the same risks of parasitism, if they're kept well. And so there are some benefits for the animals as well. But I think also an important point is there is an inevitability that these animals will be kept. And if we ban exotic animal keeping, these animals will end up in a small enclosure under someone's bed in secret, and they won't have particularly good welfare. And I think that is an important consideration as well. And interestingly, Norway recently overturned its ban on reptile keeping, which was in place for 40 years, because so many people were keeping these animals underground, and it was really bad for animal welfare. Um, that's 
pretty much it. I think my conclusion is education, research, regulation, we can in some circumstances meet their welfare needs, not in all circumstances, but I don't think prohibition is the answer. Thank you very much.